entire family was Baptist for, for multiple generations. One Baptist minister after another in the family. And then suddenly, um, uh, one, of the, one of the brothers dies and leaves a farm unattended. And nobody comes and helps. But the Mormons, the Mormons come and help with the harvest and tend to the farm and help this Baptist widow get back on her feet and take care of her. And from that point on, the family becomes Mormon. Generation after generation is then Mormon. You know, so people are complicated. You know, what need is it that they think that is being met? The older you get, you know, it, it, can, it can truly be as simple as trying to hedge your bet. You know, because you don't really know exactly what's going to happen you know, after six weeks in the nursing home. You know, so so I, I think it's individual. I don't know if there's one particular answer for that. I really don't. Next. I suppose that my question would be, since you spent about 25 years within uh, ministry, uh, not necessarily say hey, ministry, but as a pastor, uh, looking back now, is, uh, do you have any regrets to how you might have acted toward people who themselves pronounce atheists? Say, say that last part. Uh, what uh, regrets may you have about how you have reacted in the past while you were still a pastor and just people who came out officially? Oh, yeah, that, that's an easy to answer. Nobody did. Nobody in, in my 25 years of experience, I don't ever remember a single person coming to me and telling me that they, you know, have thought this through and, and that they're an atheist. I, I don't know if there was just a, um, you know, a separation between us and, and they didn't feel like, you know, that they should run to the pastor to tell him that, you know. I don't know what, why that happened, but I, I kid you not, in my world, atheism was not an issue. The secular world just simply did not exist. The night that I finally realized, or allowed myself to realize, that I truly, not only that I was an atheist, but that there was absolutely no way for me to stay in Christian ministry. I struggled for years trying to find a niche and figure out a way to stay in and appease my conscience at the same time. But the night that I realized that I couldn't, that night I had no idea what was next. I had no idea. I didn't know CFI existed, SSA existed. I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything existed. And that was the reason why that I Googled Dan Barker, because I remembered seeing his book 20 years earlier and was shocked to see that there was this whole big world. So probably, especially in the last, you know, last couple of years, I'm, obviously religion is more awareness now than, than, than I was. So I never had that experience. Never did. But I can tell you, and I'm not saying this just because I'm in front of a crowd and I always want to be the good guy, you know, but I can tell you, I would have treated them wonderfully. Because I did. I had them confess far worse things to me than not believing in something invisible, let me tell you. I mean, I've been, I've been during times of confession that I thought, we both need an attorney. <laughs> if, I, if I don't go and report this to the police immediately, I'm probably going to end up in jail, you know. I mean, I've had people tell me things that literally have given me nightmares. And so I, and I love them, and, and I treated them with kindness. And I'm, I, there's no doubt in my mind I would have done the same thing then, no doubt. But that hasn't happened to me necessarily. Yes, ma'am. Um, have you ever had any, uh, have you ever had just Christian, do you have just Christian um, ministers come or you have other religious leaders and people who like the Jewish leaders or the Muslim leaders? Oh, come to the clergy project? Yeah. Yes, that's a fantastic question. We do have Muslims in the clergy project. Um, we have Buddhists, which that blows me away. I'm like, really? Um, we have Buddhists. Let's see, what else? Um, what other religions might we have represented? Uh, it, it's it's pretty varied. Now, the majority of our of our ministers are uh, Baptist. The next is Pentecostals. Uh, probably after that, it gets uh, it kind of breaks down a little bit between like Methodist and Episcopalians and Lutherans and such as that. It, it really fits pretty good with the demographics of the United States. You know, we've got just about as many women ministers within the clergy project as there are proportionally in the United States. We've got just as many, you know, Baptists as there. But but we do. Matter of fact, just um, since I've been on the road, I think I've seen two more applications come through from from uh, Muslims. So, which is pretty cool. It's 
very, very tricky, obviously. Not nearly as easy as mine. So, anybody else? It's still early. We can't go eat yet. Hi. So, you mentioned about how the secular movement is sort of building a generation that loves themselves. Um, given the recent troubles that have been going on with the movement. Are there troubles? Well, the schisms and the continuing opposition we face. Um, do you think that, how, where do you see us going in the next few years? Like, where do you see the movement going? How are we going to deal with these problems in your opinion? I think, I think as a whole, we will, will, will grow out of it. You know, I think, I think there's, there, there's, there's so many inherent obstacles, you know, that, uh, that are related to the history of the secular movement itself. And this is, this is a fabulous time to live in. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful time when someone can, you know, sit on their couch in their apartment at 3 o'clock in the morning and hammer out a thousand words on a blog. And more than likely, you know, 36 hours later, the chief of staff of the president's reading. You know, I mean, it, it's a fascinating time that this information can be shared so quickly and be so influential. But, but here's, here's the thing. Where, where, we, where I think we have a problem is that we, we try to distinguish ourselves so, hard, so wholeheartedly from religion. We try to say religion is over there, secular is over here, and the two you know, never meet, never collide. It's, it's just night and day between each other. But, but religion is really just a byproduct of the human experience. It's just part of being human, and it's part of our history, and it's a byproduct of the development of civilization. It's the byproduct of the development of social order. And so it's part of the human experience. So sometimes, from my perspective, because I, I focused so intently. Matter of fact, there's this book, Hope After Faith, that talks about it. I, I focused so intently on religion that I feel like I, I at least know the, the people side of it the heart side, the emotional side of it, as well as anyone. And because I did, now that I'm in the secular movement, it's pretty easy for me to say, that looks religious, that looks religious, now you're acting religious, now you're acting just like a religious person. Now you're it's easy for me to do that. But the problem with that is, is that really what we're doing is just acting like human beings. This is just what humans do. This is part of the human experience. Humans jockey for positions, okay? And right now it feels as if in the secular movement that there's such limited resources that it, it seems the human instinct and human ambition is to try to jockey for these positions and who can become the champion for this particular cause and the champion for that particular cause versus this one and that one. And, and that's just human experience. And I think that because our foundation is, um, is secular, and isn't built on mythology. I think I think we'll just outgrow it. I think we'll grow beyond it. It doesn't mean that we'll stop acting like human beings. But I guess what I'm trying to say is because it's not a religion, there being no God can actually survive without us. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't need us. What you need when you're trying to promote an invisible entity, then you have to have a visible representative that does a good job. Right? But whether I'm here or not, the invisible is still invisible and doesn't exist. And so I think this principle is so true and is so coherent with nature itself that this can't help but continue to go and, and spread. That's me being optimistic about it. You know? but, but what I would challenge, um, challenge all of you to do is to study the history of the humanist movement and of the secular movements of the past so that we can make sure we don't repeat the past. But I, I'm optimistic about it. I really am. Just the fact that certain political parties are having to accept same-sex marriage, you know, when you thought those things would never, ever happen, it shows that anything is possible. And so I'm, I'm encouraged, very encouraged about the future. I'm discouraged there's no more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
with the John the Baptist then? Do you put yourself down so that the atheist church can go up? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Wow, it's beautiful. That, that's and a good question. second part, which is the same question, are you living for yourself? Am I what? Are you living for yourself right now? Am I living for myself? That, that's two wonderful questions. Fabulous questions. Okay, so... Um, did everybody understand that? You know, he, he referenced back to the John the Baptist syndrome, putting yourself down so something else be up. So the first part of the question, do you have to put yourself down and put the atheist church up? And the answer to that is absolutely not. It, it's, it's a total different paradigm altogether. Um, and, and, and some of the ways that you can see that is, is that there's absolutely no expectation for a person to even attend. There's, there's no true goal set in place of like, well, you know, we, I mean, I, it was hard for me to even answer the question of how many people we have attending. You know, there's no goal of like, well, you know, we had 30 last week. Maybe we can have 40 this week. So we're going to work hard enough to draw those other 10 people. And we're going to make sure that you feel like it's very important for you to spend your time with us. You know, the whole, the whole thing shifts. The whole thing is totally different. Um, and so what goes along with that is, am I living for myself? And the answer for that is, is no, I'm not. Is that a shock? No, I'm not living for myself. And it's a mistake. And it's a mistake I'm trying now to work my way out of. The, what I now, you know, well, it goes back to one of the other questions. The, the clergy project members that are looking to come out. They, they saw me come out. They saw Teresa, you know, Teresa McBain come out. They saw Mike House come out. And, and they think, oh, well, the way to do this is to come out at this large convention. And then, like Jerry, I can get up and preach in front of a crowd. And maybe, you know, some publisher will want to give me a book deal. And there's got to be all this money in this book deal, right? And so, so it looks like that's a, a, an escape strategy, all right? But it's really not. It's not an escape strategy at all. And now we know that it's not, I know that it's not the way to do it. It's the same, the same level of self-sacrifice that I was giving when I was in the ministry, I felt propelled to give to the secular movement, that same level of self-sacrifice. And it took a while for, for, this, for this awareness to catch up with me. And I was like, wait a minute, I think I've done this before. All of this sleeping in different hotel rooms every night, all of this being on the road, all of this being dead, freaking broke continuously all the time. You know, and people say, well, at least you're making the world a better place. That's cool, but I'm pretty hungry. You know, um, you know, I've seen this before. I've lived this before. And so now what I, I'm counseling ministers to do in particular, because there's this huge temptation of, well, come out and start your own secular church. You know, come out and be a secular leader. I'm like, that's fine. We can use you. It would be great for you to be a part. And maybe you do need to have a secular congregation. But stop between coming out and going into secular leadership. Stop and give yourself a break. And figure out what it is that you really want to do. So I know this is going to sound like a midlife crisis. I understand that it will sound this way. But what I'm constantly asking myself is, what did the jury at age 17 want to do before he joined the ministry? Before he got saved at Jimmy Swagger's church in Baton Rouge and felt like he was called to save the world? What, what was his goals? What was he interested in? So, I mean, I've actually got, uh, I'm just starting to build it, but I've actually got a, a non-movement related job. You know, that's completely on the side, away from all of this. You know, for my, it'd take about three months or four months for it to build up to an income that can pay my bills. But I'm going to devote energy to something that's completely not movement related and is not, you know, secular congregation related. Because I don't draw anything from that either. So, am I, am I living for myself? Just starting to. Just beginning to get it. Just beginning to understand what it means to even to even have that opportunity. Yeah. Just that's a fabulous question. And see, the great thing about where we're at is, is that I can tell you that. Okay? Because it's not my responsibility to convince you that there is no God. So since it's not my responsibility to convince you that, then I can get up and tell you that it's important for you to live for yourself and then openly acknowledge that I'm not yet living for myself. But if it was in the ministry days... And I delivered this message that you've got to do something a particular way because I'm representing this invisible entity. You ask me that question, then I've got to lie to you about it. Because your salvation is more important than my honesty. And I'm, 
you know. But I don't give a crap what you think. <laughs> Which is awesome. Hi. Thank you. A great question. Very deep. Are you yes. a psychology major or something? What you got going on? Okay. Uh, I, I was, uh, I like the fact that you used the word addiction earlier in your talk about um, in relation to religion. And I think, um, I actually work with a lot of people who are addicted. And um, it seems to me that uh, religion and uh, religion is one form of addiction that people use to deal with loneliness yes. and isolation, which I think is one of the most um, things that we fear the most. That's why solitary confinement is used in prison. It is like the most extreme form of punishment, even worse than capital punishment. Right. But, um, but the fact that it took you 20-some years to, to recognize this addiction and then deal with it um, reminds me of uh, a veteran I just talked to who has taken 20-some years to be able to talk about some of his experiences that have traumatized him, caused him to become an alcoholic. Um, we've become addicted to a lot of things in order to avoid isolation and um, uh, uh, and that, that form of uh, you know self torture, but um, but I and I do think that your secular congregation idea is a great idea because that's one of the reasons religion is so powerful is that it creates a sense of community for people who are already lonely. Right. And um, hopefully, hopefully something like that will catch on. I have a friend who's gay and. Um, pretty open about it and goes to clubs and has a boyfriend and all. And um, yet he goes to a church on Sunday morning to sing in a choir and the church is like flagrantly anti-gay. Right? I, I honestly can't understand why he does this, but he gets a sense of satisfaction out of belonging to that group. Right. Um, it, it's like, I, I think the sense of belonging is such a powerful motivator that um, it is. makes people do things like that. that. That's a good point. I'm glad you referenced back to the addiction. You know, my, my take on this, and this, I, I don't mean to sound, you know, you know like I'm, I'm being, you know, some type of uh, I'm a morbid, morbid person, but, but, but life's pretty difficult. You know, I mean, life is difficult. Life is, you know, filled with colds and flus and diarrhea and stumped toes. And, you know, there's just, even when it's at its best, you didn't get enough sleep, your body aches. I mean, life, life's difficult, and, and this little extra bit of consciousness that we have has the potential, and I think it happens for most of us, kind of makes it a little harder, you know, because you're aware of your own demise, you're aware of this heightened level of relationships that's so hard to maintain and be balanced. Just being a human is difficult. And so, and from my from my perspective, much of what we do through life is really just one form of self-medicating or another. That's all we're doing is just self-medicating. You know, you don't feel like you want to feel, you go and you get something to eat. You don't feel like you want to feel, get some drink. You don't feel like you want to feel, you watch TV. You don't feel like you want to feel, you go to work so that you can pay the bills that made you feel bad. And we're just always changing our chemistry. We're always affecting our chemistry, either, you know, unintentionally or intentionally. And so church, what's underestimated about religion many times is its ability to affect our chemistry. And there's something very special about believing the mythology, that placebo effect, that when you walk into that service and the music plays and you are standing next to this person that you've known you know, for the last 10 years that was with you whenever your baby was born and stood in the hospital, stood outside in the corridor whenever your dad died or you know, all these relationships, it, it changes body chemistry in a way that is intentional and very, very effective. Very effective. And so in our version of Christianity, Pentecostalism or the charismatic movement, that's what we're all about. Your entire religious experience is summed up in one question. What was church like last night? That's what we'll ask. What was church like last night? Now, think of all of the other types of uh, Christianity that are somewhat dry. You know, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't ask yourselves that. You know, I, I can't picture Lutherans meeting up, you know, at the catfish hut the next day and say, I miss service. What church like last night? And Pentecostals, what they're, what they're trying to get at is, is, was there this emotional breakthrough? You know, did the service generate this, this group phenomenon where everyone felt empowered or everyone felt enriched and it caused people to run or it caused people to clap or it caused people to laugh? It's almost like saying, you know, I heard you went to the movies last night. Was that movie good? 
Because I, if, if it felt good to you, it'll feel good to me. I don't want to do it. And that's, that's what religion and religious services are known for doing, is giving you those highs. And it becomes very addictive. Very, very addictive. And that goes back to the nostalgic need. The only problem is, is that when you take away belief in the mythology, it's very difficult to get that same chemical reaction. <laughs> you know, very, very difficult. You know, it's like trading cocaine for Coca-Cola. You know, it's just not going to do the same thing. And you know it's not, so it's tricky. Anybody else? It's probably all yours, my friend. I don't see anybody else. Okay, and that is it. If there are any more questions, I thought... Actually, if I could ask one more. Um, you said you were Pentecostal. Yes. yes. Um, now, does that involve uh, charismatic, so speaking in tongues, prophecy, laying of hands? I thought I was going to make it through at least one meeting where speaking in other tongues didn't come up. Okay. <laughs> yes. No, I'm thinking of yes. um, Like, you grew up around family and friends that did that, and they saw you engage in those activities. Yes. Uh, how are conversations... When people say, like, I saw you, you prophesied, you, like, you laid your hands on Aunt Mildred, and she got better. Right. Like, how can you deny that after your experience? Yeah. So, I'm fortunate in one way that um, I've, I've been kind enough to enough people in my life that if they think that conversation is going to in any way be controversial or contentious, they don't bring it up. But that's not everybody. I've had people. Um, I've had people ask me those very questions. You know, they'd say, "You you prophesied, and that came to pass." Or, you know, you you. Um, we had the whole range of the gifts of the spirit. So one of the gifts of the spirit is uh, a word of knowledge, right? See, you know, speak in your language, a word of knowledge. That would be that'd be like I would look out at this lady. And I, you know, I'd say, you know, the Lord is the Lord is uh, is telling me that uh, you've really got something heavy on your heart tonight. Really something, something's really pressing on your heart. Is that right? You, you feel, see, and, and so, and so then, as yeah, not really, she's like, ain't, ain't nothing bothering me. Yeah, I, it feels like I'm at the beach. Um, but, but as you're as you're going through that, then then maybe details come about. You know, I remember one case in particular where there was a young lady that um, she came up front. I was praying with her, and and I, I this is just what happened. This is just what happened. I looked at her and I said. Uh, one of your friends wrote a really bad letter about you that you just found out about. And her eyes got huge and she said, that's exactly right. I said, don't you believe that stuff about yourself? You know? And, I mean, so, you know, you got a lot of explaining to do when those things happen. And people who will actually engage me in the conversation, uh, it's an opportunity to explain to them the power of coincidence and how that we don't count our misses. Only our hits. You know, the misses just disappear into history, but the hits become landmarks in the story and narrative of our lives. And, and that's the important part is, is when you make this kind of turn, especially when you've been the minister or you've been some influential person in the community, you're part of the narrative. You're part of the story that they tell either to themselves or to other people, right? And suddenly a character is very much out of place. You know, it turned out the butler really did do it. You know, you were trusting him, but he did kill them all, you know. And what a surprise, you know, what a twist. Right? Anybody? No? Okay. Anyway, so uh, so it, it does give you it does give you some hard explaining to do, but it, there hasn't been that many. The one that really probably bothered me the most most recently was I had a young lady, not a young lady, I had a, a middle-aged lady through Facebook. She contacted me and she wanted to know exactly what I believed the day that I baptized her. Because her concern was, was that her baptism might not be valid. And it, it, it halfway ticked me off. Because I feel like that that's the difference between her and me. And it's why I'm where I'm at and she's still where she's at. Because if at any, po at any point in my spiritual life, if I would have thought my baptism wasn't valid, I would have already gotten rebaptized before anybody knew it. Because I was in charge of my spiritual journey, you know, my quest. And, and, and I asked her, I said, if there's any doubt, just go get rebaptized. 
You know, I mean, I, I can't tell you what I believed exactly at that moment, but there are. And, and actually, the audio is out. And one of the neat things about the audio of this book is that David Smalley, uh, with Dog with Debate, he interviews me at the end of the audio book, and we discuss some of the more profound things that happen in the book. You know, like the Holy Spirit leading me through a hospital to a, hotel, to a hospital. So, yeah, we do have to answer for it from time to time. And it's, it's deflating, you know. Whenever you have to tell them, there's this thing that you've never experienced called coincidence. Yeah. Yes? Your feelings about your childhood, I imagine you have. You know, whenever she read it, my stepdad didn't read it, but whenever she read it, what she told me was, was that she, she set it down in front of my stepdad, and her words were, and I hope this isn't too personal, but... She would hate that sickness. Uh, but she set it down. She looked at my stepdad. They got divorced whenever I was about 15. And then they got remarried. Though. They got married after I had gotten married. You know, my joke always was, sure would have been cool if y'all got y'all's act together when I was a kid. But, you know, whatever. Um, and, but she, she, when she finished the book, she closed it. She set it down next to my stepdad. And she said, the Jerry DeWitt that we thought we knew is dead. You know? That's part of that identity suicide, you know, because it was all there. All the truth was there. How, how you know, fearful I was growing up in the home and, you know, how I was dealing with, with their relationship is all there. And, and that was tough. It was tough writing it because I knew she would read it, you know. It was very, very tough, but it's been dealt with. The only part that's left undone is the relationship with my grandmother, who's really the matriarch of our family. And, uh, and we're dancing around each other. She's Pentecostal. You know, and so we're dancing around the subject lest we hurt each other's feelings. But she just turned 86, uh, and so we just need to have a talk. That would be me living for myself when I do that. That would be part of it. Anybody else? I'm not from here, so I, I could be here for all night. So, you know. You're asking me. Bye-bye. Um, the relationship with your wife after you came out, I mean, I guess even before that, um, was she aware of, of your sort of change of heart in here? And, and after that, I mean, she eventually left you? Yes. Um, how did that play out before she left you and you know, before you came out? I, so that, that's an important part because on the surface, some people hear it and they're like, well, boom on her. Because she left you, you know, and you became an atheist or whatever. And, 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 and there, are, there are reasons to feel that way to a degree. You know, she did leave at a very, 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 very low time in our lives. And so my son and I both have had to deal with that, you know. But there's so much more to it. And it's the reason that any time I give a presentation like I did tonight, I really try to show just how complicated relationships are, just how complicated things are. It's not clean cut about, well, he was a Christian, now he's an atheist, I'm going to pack up all my stuff and move to another state, you know. Um, she wasn't crazy about being in the ministry to start with. All right, about literally about six months into our marriage, and we were married for 23 years, um, she saw real quickly she was not enjoying being a preacher's wife. And so it's kind of like dragging a dead weight, you know, for the rest of, of the career, trying to halfway please her, but halfway try to fulfill the mission. The mission's bigger than our happiness, all of that kind of crazy thinking that you don't do when you're living for yourself. And so... Um, so she put up with it. I thought, I thought for a moment when I became the mayor's chief of staff and a political career was building alongside the ministry that it would eclipse, the political career would eclipse the ministry. Um, I had to leave that as well because everybody saw me as the preacher at City Hall and I was trying to get away from that preacher identity. But I thought maybe that would be good because she felt such a weight of responsibility being the pastor's wife. Regardless of what I would tell the congregation, you know, I mean, I, I must have said it a hundred times. You know, she's not the assistant pastor. She just happens to be the poor person who's married to your pastor. You know, she's not the Sunday school superintendent. She's not the second most spiritual person in the building. She just happens to be here because she rode here with me, you know. Uh, but no matter how much I reiterated that, she still felt that pressure. And people still put that pressure on her to a degree. And she hated it. And so I thought the political career might would make it better. And uh, I was supposed to actually run for mayor next year for my town. Uh, we, were, we were working out, you know, the strategy for all that. And would have won had it not been for all of this. There's no doubt about it. 
because of the base that I have within the community. And she told me, she said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to support you. You know, I don't want you to be mayor. I don't want you to have a public life because I don't want a public life. So there was more to it than that. So when you take, there's already that level of dissatisfaction. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was, I don't like him because he's up in front of everybody as the preacher or the politician. And then suddenly you flip it. And now he's the most disliked person in the community. That was too much. She bore it out for months, but we, we, you know, obviously we lost all of her income. The house was in foreclosure, and she was starting to pull things out of the house to sell at a garage sale out in the carport. And one of the neighbors walked up and said, I am so sorry they're talking about y'all the way they're talking about y'all on this street. You know, you don't deserve that. You know how people do. You know? I'm sorry they're talking about y'all. Everybody feels so sorry for you that you're married to this atheist. And that was it. That was it. It was just almost within hours her vehicle was packed and she was gone. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty complicated. That's a happy note to end on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you did good. Uh, well, if there aren't any more questions, I think that's just the end of our events tonight. I'd just like to thank Jerry again for coming to speak. Social before a while things have been going on, I'm sure. And uh, I also heard, I'm not sure if you guys did, that there's a book for sale outside. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a lot like this one. Oh, wow. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, again for coming. And uh, hopefully, you'll be able to attend the other events that uh, either the Michigan SSA or CFI uh, in Southeast Michigan are going to be putting on in the coming uh, weeks and months.